Good to see everybody this morning. How is everybody feeling on a beautiful Sunday? Give it up to, uh, let's see, Megan in Kentucky is watching right now. Hey, Bill in Arizona, I know you lost your sister. Been praying for you. Is that my friend, Pastor Phil Lewis, watching in Florida? Give it up for Pastor Phil, everybody. His wife, Mindy, as well. Uh, Lisa in Michigan, how are you? Jay, not only here, but in Mississippi. Dottie in Idaho. Beth in West Virginia. Tanya in Minnesota. And the Robins, the Swiss family Robinson family in Ontario, Canada. No, no just the, the Robinson family. Give it up for everybody watching all across everywhere. Check this picture out. This is a unprecedented thing for us. It'll come on the screen. This last Thursday night, Pastor Mike and I got to do our very first online campus plug into Pathways. First time I did that in 2003, we had 12 people join the church way back in the day. We had 19 join us from all across the United States to join the church as a part of our online campus family. How awesome is that? That's cool. Really good times, really good times, and so uh, super good to be here, guys. I know that last song that Scott sang in that video, you're like, that is heavy, but here's what we're going to we're gonna talk about today. We're really in earnest going to start walking toward the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I do not pretend to know all the baggage that you have in your life. All of us, if we don't watch it, we struggle with baggage. We're in this series called Unclaimed Baggage. And week one, we talked about David, who had a lot of sin in his suitcase. Anybody have some sin in your suitcase? Uh, we talked about the Apostle Paul, who had a thorn in his flesh. What is that? I mean, ultimately, hey, God, I got baggage that I don't, I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to deal with it. We talked about the rich young ruler in the opposite way, like he wanted to hold on to his baggage, but it became a barrier between he and God. Last week, we talked about the boy with the impure spirit in Mark chapter 9. The father, so desperate. Every parent's nightmare, right? What happens if my child is out of control? What happens in a situation where our baggage is exposed? People don't like baggage exposed, especially in our communities. This week, we're going to look at a guy that you're like, Brent, I don't know how in the world I can relate, but we're going to talk about our conscience, Does anybody, everybody understand what the word conscience means, that you have a conscience? How many people have a conscience? Would you raise your hand high? All of us do. And and it's a separator, right? Especially from these atheist agnostic types that are like, well, God is not real. We're all just kind of, we were created with some big bang. We're kind of mammals. We once were apes and now we're humans. But why do we still have apes if we've anyway... But science can't explain our conscience. There there is something built within us, God who created us, that we know the difference between right and wrong. And so ultimately we're going to talk about this as we make our way to Easter. And so let's, let's, let's talk about Easter for a minute. Easter is in two weeks. It'll come on the screen. We've got all these identical options, and I want to make sure before we jump into this message that you guys are prepared to walk this road with me. Wednesday night, the 31st, uh, 5.30 and 7 are identical options to the weekend as normal. The 7 p.m. service will know as of this coming week is our last mask-only service, and then when we get into Easter week, they're back to identical options, 5.30 and 7, mask optional, just show up. We're going to balance everything. Saturday night is 6 p.m. our service. Sunday morning, 8 Easter sir the Easter services on April 4th the 8 a.m. service that week will be a mask required service we're going to give a Sunday morning 8 a.m. service adding a service so if you want to be here and you're like Brent some of you're watching online you're like I really want to come to church for Easter but it's been kind of a weird year that's the service for you if you want to invite somebody do that as well and then of course 9 30 and 11 15 and I'm hoping we pack the place out I'm hoping people come out of the woodwork to celebrate This idea that love moved first. Sometimes in our baggage, and you saw it in that video, and if you didn't get it, um, Jeanette, who Jeanette and Joel are a part of our church. Jeanette is a huge part of our creative team. You saw this couple, and she lost her husband in a loss. Whether death, whether it's divorce, man, it's easy to get stuck in our baggage. And I'm so grateful that love moved first, that God came to send his only son to die on a cross to take away the sin in our baggage that we have in our lives. And we can celebrate 
the resurrection of Christ together. So be a part of Easter. Good Friday is also coming. It's a week from Friday, April the 2nd, 1215 to 1245. It's my favorite service of the year. Once again, my dad will be a part of that service, which if I don't watch it, I'll cry. I just love that moment that we can remember what God did for all of us. So today we're going to look at a guy named Pilate, Pontius Pilate. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 27, John chapter 18, and John chapter 19. I've been preaching a long time now, and I really don't remember, and I looked back over my notes through the years, and I never really gave full attention to Pilate and his dilemma, his struggle as he once again would have this moral struggle wrestle with his conscience because he came face to face with Jesus Christ, God's son on the earth. Pilate, how many people have ever heard of Pilate? Would you raise your hand high? I'm not talking about the gas station. That's that's Pilate. Or the Elton John song, take me to the... I'm talking about Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea who sentenced Jesus Christ to death on the cross. And you're like, Brent, I can't relate to him, okay? I mean, the rich young ruler, maybe I, I saw that, but Pilate, how can we relate to Pilate? Oh, man. Can we ever? And really is around the word conscience, your conscience. It'll come on the screen. Conscience is described a couple things. Please take some notes because all of us live here. Our conscience is what a person believes is right and how we decide what is right. You're like, well, man, that is a slippery slope today, and you're right. And I'm going to say this as your pastor and as a person of faith. If you don't tether your conscience to God's word, it's a dicey slope that you'll live in. You will be overcome by the cultural tidal wave, and your conscience can become dull. Your conscience is more more than some gut instinct. Actually, it'll come on the screen this way. It is moral muscle, something that you develop. Look at me. Everybody look at me. I have developed and sculpted my muscles through the years, and look at the definition that it, it takes a lot of effort I work out. Y'all, y'all don't know this, but for the last eight or nine months, I lift weights about three days a week with my friend Josh Chambers. He's 38 years old. I'm 50. And he looks built. And the other day at the gym, I said, Josh, why am I not sculpted? And he's like, Brent, you're 50. You're just, <laughs> you're just trying to beat back father time is all you're doing. But yet, you understand, right? You have to build muscle. You have to build definition. Well, in your heart and mind, we have to be tethered to God's word. If not, our conscience can become dull, and we can get really double-minded and unstable, and ultimately, it can become a downfall. And if we resist the temptation to stand on the truth when we're exposed to the truth, we'll be in opposition to the truth, and bad things can come. So I thought, man, this message is heavy. How do we lighten it up for a minute? Um, You know me, my my sense of humor is off the charts awesome. You know that about me. I am very keen with my sense. Actually, I have a lot of corniness in my sense of humor. Um, But if you don't like what I like, then you're lame. So let's see how you, you guys are. Conscience, just to get us rolling with conscience, right? Karma means I can be mean to people having a clear conscience. They probably deserved it. Yeah, you guys don't get it at all. All right, you, you'll get this one. Ready? Why don't politicians listen to their conscience? That's a good one. Because they don't like taking advice from complete strangers. That's better. Uh, now I'll be here all week. How can you tell a drug dealer apart, one who has a conscience and one who doesn't have a conscience? Drug dealers that don't have a conscience call themselves pharmaceutical reps. Right? I mean, that that's good. I like tracking on an exam, a student on an examination paper, the professor required each student to sign the bottom of each exam saying they received no outside assistance to help them on the exam. One conscientious student wrote at the bottom of his exam, I don't know if I can sign this or not because I have prayed like crazy that God would assist me on this exam. (laughs) The professor 
The professor graded the exam and said at the bottom of this failing paper, you can sign with a clear conscience. God did not assist you in any way. (laughs) That's good. My favorite, though, the older I get, (laughs) and mom proved that while ago in announcements, um, the best part of having a bad memory is that your conscience is clear, right? I mean, come on, everybody. Oh, he's not up there. (laughs) Pilate. Some of you know the story of Pilate. It's too familiar to you. You you know the, the story of Jesus standing before Pilate, and you think, man, Pilate, how awful of an individual. But Pilate's conscience is screaming in Scripture. He's wrestling with the right thing to do. You're like, really? So I want to read, I want to put two, I want to put one moment together in, with two uh, of the Gospels. We're going to tell the same account because the Gospels tell these different accounts or the, this, about the same account in different ways. We're going to look at Matthew's account. We're going to look at John's account. And I want you to listen clearly. Maybe you've not thought of it this way before, but I want you to listen clearly to Pilate's conscience. See if you can hear it. And then we're going to see how we deal with our conscience and our struggles. Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 11, I'm going to read 23 verses. I'm going to read for a while. I want you to listen just to this moment as we begin to walk toward the cross, walk toward the resurrection, walk toward our Easter season together. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor, this is Pilate, the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priest and the elders, Jesus gave no answer. Then Pilate asked Jesus, do you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival, the festival of Passover, you'll read it in John, to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. And at that time there was a well-known prisoner remember that, whose name was Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked the crowd, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus or Barabbas? Jesus, who is called the Messiah. For he knew, Pilate knew, listen to the wording, he knew it was out of self-interest that these religious leaders had handed Jesus over to him to be sentenced. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, Pilate did the judging. His wife, interesting guys, sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Now let's switch to John chapter 18, starting in verse 33. Same account, different angle. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? I am a Jew. Am I a Jew, Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me, Jesus says. What is truth? That's my demonstrative way. You know, if you were in any Easter program back in the day in church, Pilate was always, what is truth? With this, he went out again to the Jews and gathered there, and the Jews that were gathered there, and Pilate said these words. Listen to this. How many times does he say this? I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom to release, I can release to you a prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. John chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, beaten, whipped. 
The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe, went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know I find no basis for a charge against him. Can you hear Pilate's conscience? When Jesus came out wearing the, the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to him, here's the man. As soon as the chief priest and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against this man. Can you hear Pilate's conscience? The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law. And according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. Verse 16, finally, Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified. Write this down and take some notes. The verdict of Pilate's own conscience is very clear. You can hear it in Scripture. He understood something was very unusual here, something different, something legit, something authentic, someone authentic, something, someone supernatural. Pilate was not a Jew. He was a Roman. Romans were religious. They believed in demigods like Hercules and mythology. So Pilate stood here, and there was someone in front of him that was a standout. My son-in-law would say, bona fide legit. We don't think about it in human terms. Pilate was a judge. How many people do you think Pilate had to judge in the course of a day or a week or a month? How many scumbags stood before him? How many people were either trembling in fear or lying out of their teeth? They weren't sorry they did it. They were sorry they got called at it by the Romans. Pilate was a judge. And here he, he you can hear his conscience screaming, Guys, there is something way different about this individual. What are you doing? Why are you even asking me? There is nothing. This guy has done nothing wrong. Someone supernatural, someone very unusual, someone who represented the truth. It's the very son of God who created him in all things standing in front of him. Don't tell me his conscience did not know. Anyone that does not stand for the truth, will stand in opposition to the truth. This week, Wednesday, I called my friend. I love to say this, that I have a friend who is Judge Raider in town. I have a friend that's a judge. Some of you know Judge Jeff Raider. He's one of the judges in town. Some of you have probably stood before him in a court of law. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on that. I've been in the courtroom before when he has sentenced people. I've been in the courtroom before when someone stood up and was really snotty and copped an attitude and, whoo, Bulldog Raider came out, man. I saw him slam the gavel down. I, he doesn't remember this moment, so it must have happened a lot because I kid him about it all the time. He slammed the gavel down. He goes, son, you're going to spend two years in the state penitentiary starting tonight, and I'm going to go home and sleep like a baby. <laughs> slammed his gavel down. So I called him, and I said, judge, man, you have sentenced a lot of people. You see a lot. If you go down to the Sevier County Courthouse, whew, reality bites. It's awful. And I said, how many people have stood in front of you that immediately you can tell there's something way different about that person? His words are level up. He goes, if somebody stands before me and I see them level up and I see them contrite, they're not just sorry they did it. I mean, they're truly sorry. Or some people that have stood there that he felt like truly did not do it, were truly innocent. He goes, my meter for that is very high. As many years as I've done this, I can see people trembling in fear. Boy, they're sure guilty. I can see people that are trying to lie and bribe their way out of a circumstance. But he goes, Brent, trust me. My, I, I can spot it a mile away when someone's legit. So could Pilate. We don't think about that in human terms. Pilate's conscience is screaming at him. God's grace is on the move how about this, guys? God's grace is so awesome. As Pilate's wrestling with his conscience, he knows this man is innocent. Here's a letter from his wife, the, the wiser, better half. 
You think that happened every day? Of course it didn't happen every day. Pilate's wife gives him a note right as he's wrestling. Gee, I wonder what I should do. Boom, have nothing to do with this innocent man. It's the joke, right? The guy that drowned because the flood came and he drowned and he was on top of the roof of his house. And a guy with a boat came by and the guy's like, no, that's okay. God will take care of me. And a guy with a helicopter flew by. No, that's okay. God will take care of me. And the guy drowns and gets to heaven. You've heard that joke, right? And God's like, what happened? And the guy's like, I thought you were going to take care of me. And God's like, I sent a boat and a helicopter. <laughs> anyway, that's old school. You haven't heard that? That's... Even God's cracked in the mic right there. So even in the middle of this wrestling with his conscience moment, Pilate's wife sends him a note. That did not happen during that day. Hey, hey, Pilate, have nothing to do with this innocent man. Pilate is going to try to appease his conscience. He's going to try to get out of the situation. He has a stroke of genius. He uses a custom, a a festival custom, the, the festival of the Passover against these Jewish leaders. He knows what is happening. Trust me, here's what you got to understand. The story is this. The Roman government loved to pacify the people that they conquered. They didn't want an uprising. They didn't want an issue. When they went in and conquered a nation like Israel, they didn't want any problems. They just wanted to make sure they governed a group of people to make sure they paid their taxes on time. You're going to hear a lot more about that in the next couple of years. So Pilate, listen, he's already been called on the carpet. History knows this. He's already in a little bit of a, hey, I want to make sure I don't ruffle any feathers with Caesar and the Roman government. And the religious leaders play right into Pilate's fear because they start touting, what well, if you don't do anything about this Jesus guy who calls himself the king of the Jews, then you're going to be very disloyal to Caesar. They know the Jewish leaders know where to stick the dagger. And Pilate starts to wrestle with, wait a minute, do I do the right thing even though this could cost me? So Pilate comes up with this idea. It's a good one. We don't think about it. He pits Barabbas, this loser dirtbag that's got a rap sheet this long. The Bible says, very well known. People didn't like him against Jesus. Do you think those were the only two prisoners in jail? Do you think Pilate couldn't have lined up 50 people and said, y'all get to pick one? No, Pilate, or Pilate goes, I'll, I'll pick the worst possible dirt rocker I can find against this guy that everybody sees as something different. And surely they're going to choose Jesus over Barabbas, and they don't. The mob rule wins. Then he does something really ceremonial. Something you're like, oh, we can't relate to that. Sure we can. He takes a bowl of water. Pilate washes his hands. Says, hey, his blood's not on me. It's on you. The Jews will make that famous statement, fine. His blood will be on us and our children. Whew. But the blood of Jesus is on Pilate's hands. The Jews had no authority to do anything. They knew that. Why do you think they brought him there? Pilate could have easily said, you guys are crazy. Cuckoo for Cocoa Pa. You're nuts. There's nothing wrong here. I mean, his conscience is screaming. But he washes his hands in some ceremonial way and says, oh, you know what? I'm innocent of this man's blood. No. Jesus' blood was on his hands too. You're like, how do we relate to that? I see it all the time. I see people, they call, hey, I want to get baptized. In the South in particular, let's get baptized. I'll get in the water because baptism will save me and set me free. And they think, you know what, then I can go live like hell the rest of my days. Pilate's conscience is screaming. God's grace is intervening. Sends a letter from his wife. But yet, here's the analogy that we all relate to today. The voice of the crowd is in conflict with Pilate's conscience, but Pilate chooses to please the crowd. That's us. How many times you heard this lately? Something's wrong with America. Sure going to hell in a handbasket around here. Boy, something's wrong. Why are people not standing up for what is right? Who's heard that lately? Anybody? I'm like, that's all y'all's Facebook post. 
Somebody put on Facebook this morning, Joe Biden's not going to get my guns. I keep them upstairs. I mean, y'all, you guys are crazy. Y'all guys are crazy. You're crazy. Oh, Lord, I should not have said that at all. That's bad news right there. We've heard it though, right? I mean, I, I'm asking the question, is this a ripple in our culture or is there a tectonic plate moving? But man, things are spiraling out of control. And if you don't see what is happening, it is creation. All of us with this idea of the power of science and technology, basically saying we don't need the creator. We don't want to surrender to the creator. We even say, you know what? Let's numb our conscience. Let's dull our conscience. Let's just listen to the culture. If your conscience is not tethered to God's word, it's a slippery slope. God's word, his blueprint for our identity, for our marriage, for our home. Now we can get to, well, you know what? What used to be right, uh, it's okay to do that now. What used to be wrong, it's, you say what's right. That's not what I believe. And now there's like all of this moving target. But have you noticed how much baggage is in people's life today? Like more than ever. So what mistakes did Pilate make? It's an interesting question. The voice of the crowd is in conflict with his conscience. He wants to please the crowd. He knew the right thing to do was to set Jesus free but he was not willing to pay the price to do the right thing. Rest of the story. A couple of things we never think about. Can you imagine the conversation that Pilate and his wife had the day after? After Pilate allowed this moment to happen, can you imagine what Pilate's wife would be saying? You're an idiot. How about this? After it begins to circulate in the community about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're eating brunch together at the palace. Pilate had a lot to lose. His wife and he were comfortable. He didn't want to ruffle any feathers. He wanted to keep his governorship. He wasn't willing to pay the price. He knew the right thing to do, but he wasn't willing to pay the price because his personal life was nice and cushy. Nice palace, two camels in the garage, all good. <laughs> Can you imagine after the resurrection accounts begin to circulate, Pilate and his wife? You're an idiot. I mean, can you imagine that moment? Do you realize the Greek, Greek Orthodox Church, even to this day, celebrate Pilate's wife as a saint because of the letter that she wrote him to intervene on behalf of Jesus Christ? The rest of the story, it's not in the Bible, but the historian Josephus will say in 36 AD, Pilate is called to the carpet, goes back to Rome, loses his governorship. Three years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Pilate is exiled to a city in Gaul, which is modern-day France, and most historians will say that Pilate committed suicide. He wrestled with his conscience. He was exposed to the truth. And he decided to stand on the side of the opposition. Many of us are there today. What mistakes did he make? What can we learn? Number one, Pilate valued the wrong things. He chose temporary comfort over eternity and truth. Jesus said it, right? Everyone who listens to me stands on the side of the truth. There are a lot of people today that hear the truth, but they choose to stand in opposition. It's their call. A lot of us today value the wrong things. That's our call. Number two, Pilate failed to heed God's warning. I mean, here's Pilate's wife. That didn't happen. I'm telling you guys and girls, that didn't happen in that culture. She would not have intervened like that. God, I, you, can, you can sense it stirred in her. Wait a minute. I got to do this. I got to tell. Maybe, maybe my husband will listen to me, the wiser, better half. 
He knew it. I mean, his conscience over and up three times. I find no basis for a charge against this man. Nothing. He failed to heed God's warning. He valued the wrong things. I don't know if I said it. Number two, he feared the wrong things. Number three, he failed to heed God's warning. He feared the wrong things. He, his fear of man was stronger than his fear of God. I wonder if that's us today. More than ever in our cancel culture, people know there's something wrong and we got to stand up for what is right. But if I stick my neck out too far, somebody's going to chop it off. So I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. You're like, people don't, people don't live that way. Sure they do. Our culture surely won't go down the tube. Sure it will. Do you think everybody in Nazi Germany was a Nazi at the beginning of that? They just failed to keep their mouths open to the truth. They kept their mouths shut to what was happening. Pretty soon the tidal wave of the culture swept them all downstream. You don't think they knew what was happening at concentration camps that were right around their communities? I mean, it happens. It happens in... Humanity, you see it over and over again. But four is the most important to me. It's a lesson for me. It's a lesson for you. We all, young to old, we better understand this in this culture. We better understand this in this day and age. And this is huge. Pilate failed to take a firm stand for what he knew was right. He was double-minded. He was torn between two directions. On the one hand, he wanted to do the right thing. You can hear it in Scripture. But he was unwilling to take personal risk to do it. The truth is we must learn. Ready? How about this? In my life and in yours. What, what, what do we got to learn from Pilate's error? A little compromise in your life will lead to a lot of compromise. You allow a little bit of baggage just to hold on to you, or you hold on to a little bit, you will accumulate more and more and more. A little compromise leads to a whole lot of compromise. A half-hearted stand for what is right will crumble under temptation every time. It happens. Make a firm decision to do what's right in your life and don't play around with the alternatives. Whew. Wish people would listen. Make the decision to do what's right and then trust God with the outcome. That's all you can do. We're all faced with all kinds of moral struggles. Ask God to give you the courage to do the right thing. Listen. Listen to his voice through his word. Do you realize how powerful this moment is in your life every week for all of us? The power of the hour. If not, we can easily get washed downstream. What we used to think is wrong, we now think is okay and right if we don't pay attention and listen to the Holy Spirit, our compass and our guide as we follow God's word. I mean, I've never preached about Pilate like that. We've always kind of glazed over that moment. And some of you are like, well, Brent, man, that's the providence of God. If Pilate would have done the right thing, then Jesus wouldn't have died. I believe that Jesus Christ came to the earth to die on a cross for us. All of us make choices. Pilate chose wrongly, and he paid the price. You know what? He had a few more years of luxury, three, and he lost it all. 36 AD, it was gone. I want to introduce you to a guy. I don't know if you know this guy or not. His name is Martin Niemuller. He was a pastor in Berlin during the time of the Nazis. Before that, he was a renowned U-boat captain for Germany in World War I. Niemuller was not a Nazi, but he was a sympathizer. For a while, he would keep quiet, but ultimately his conscience began to bother him so much that he began to speak out against the atrocities of what Nazi Germany stood for. He was persecuted. He was imprisoned. And the words are now infamous engraved on his tombstone. Listen to what he said and how powerful this is for us today. Niemuller, these are the words on his tombstone today. When they came for the communist, talking about the Nazis, I said nothing because I wasn't a communist. When they came for the Jews, I said nothing 
I wasn't Jewish. When they came for the trade unionist, I said nothing, Nia Mueller would write. I wasn't a trade unionist. When they came for the Catholics, I said nothing because I wasn't a Catholic. But when the Nazis came for me, no one said anything because there was no one left. If we as Christians don't stand up for the truth, how will the truth ever set people free? Man, the Holy Spirit, our conscience and our guide. We're going to do something really, really different to close. We're going to go back and Scott is going to sing the song that he just sang a while ago from beginning to end. And it's going to be our moment today of confession and repentance. The whole idea for this series is just to have a moment of confession and repentance for us to say, you know what? I'm tired of the baggage in my life. God, I want to lay it down and I want to let it go. The song that Scott sang is called Dear God. It's a letter to God. It's about somebody that's wrestling and struggling like all of us do. God, I don't know if I'm doing the right things. I don't know what exactly to do, but here's my life. I just want to have a moment of confession and a moment of repentance. And God will respond. And it's a beautiful song written by Corey Asbury. But listen to a couple of the lyrics because now that we went through this message and you think of Pilate, it's like Pilate's theme song, these words. Listen to the words. Dear God, I've been chasing their approval and it's killing me. And I know the more I try to prove, all the less I have to show, I'm stuck inside my head most of the time. Because I try and I try just to fall back down again. I ask myself why. Why do I try to chase the wind? I should lean into the mystery. Maybe hope is found in the melody. I want to try again. Do you wonder? What would Pilate do if he had a do-over? If he knew what we now know. Don't you think he would say, man, I should have leaned into the mystery a little bit more because maybe hope is found in him. I think so. How many people you and I know, when it's all said and done, Brent, you're right, I should have leaned into the mystery of the gospel because hope is found in Christ. God, be in this moment be in the song that Scott's going to sing as we all just quietly close this service with a moment of confession. This is one big altar moment together. As we listen to the words of the song, we think about our conscience. God, allow us to stand on the truth and let the truth set us free. May we not give in to the voice of the crowd, but to listen to you, to be smart enough, to be wise enough to surrender our lives to you. We might not have all the answers. We might not have done or we'll do all the right things. But God, allow us as we walk toward the Easter moment together this year to lean so much more into the mystery because hope is found in the melody. Hope is found in you. So awesome. Thank you for this day. May our conscience be sharper walking out the doors than walking in. In Jesus' name we pray.